Coming up on the Civil Discourse, a panel discussion brings together four experts from different facets of the art world to explore the contradictions in contemporary art. Join us for a special conversation on contemporary art in crisis. I feel that we're actually living in a very inspiring climate right now because there's so many new technologies and new outlets that could potentially become modes of artistic expression that have yet to be tapped into. Hello and welcome to The Civil Discourse. I'm your host, Paula Morantz Cohn, Dean of Drexel University's Pannoni Honors College, speaking to you from my office in West Philadelphia. The aim of The Civil Discourse is to talk about important, often controversial subjects with candor and goodwill. Today we've convened a special panel on the topic contemporary art in crisis. For those confused by the tensions among issues of originality, politics, and market forces in contemporary art, this episode will hopefully provide some insight. I'm especially grateful to Abby Dean, an art collector herself, and Joe Gregory at Drexel for their help with this panel. Our panelists today consist of multimedia artist Kelly Wang, a curator at the New Museum in New York City, Gary Carrion Moriari, art critic and former senior editor of Art in America, Richard Vine, and collector, dealer, and owner of the New York City Gallery, Prince and Wooster, Leo Rogat. I'm eager to hear how each of these people involved in different facets of the contemporary art world see the present and future of art. Welcome all to the Civil Discourse. So our topic is contemporary art in crisis. Do you agree that there is a crisis in art right now? And if so, can each of you tell us briefly how you would define the crisis, or perhaps better if you prefer, the challenge, the major challenge facing contemporary art in your opinion? And I'll start with Kelly. Hey, thank you, Paula. I didn't actually know that people thought there was a contemporary art crisis before this panel invitation <laughs> happened. But I do think it's always challenging with contemporary art. For me, it's not necessarily different now than it was in previous time periods. For me as an artist, it's always trying to find a way to communicate my own individual experience, my own emotions through the means that are available now that are somehow relevant to the contemporary situation. And I don't think that that's necessarily so different than other periods, but I think now there might be a lot, there's a lot more freedom for artists to choose what kinds of materials, what kinds of methodology they want to use. It seems like in the past things were more restricted in a way that there's like oil painting or ink painting or, you know, like everything kind of exists in a neat category. But now almost every artist has to be a multimedia or multidisciplinary or interdisciplinary because you can't really be restricted if you want to communicate with a lot of people. I think your point about freedom being greater and that being a challenge is a fascinating one that maybe we can delve into. Leo, do you have thoughts on this subject? I certainly do. Thank you, Paula. I would say that contemporary art is not in crisis. I would argue it depends on what we consider contemporary art. Is that post-World War II? Is that artists who are alive today? I would also say that without crisis, there isn't contemporary art. There has to be, there has to be something that artists are inspired by. Many great artists in their day were not loved by their peers and contemporaries. I would say one of the issues is that in a very digital world, there is far more noise to get through and uh, finding the quality and finding the great artists is far more of a challenge. 
Interesting. So you're, in a way, complimenting Kelly's point about she sees freedom, you see noise. Fascinating. Gary, can you weigh in? You know, I don't think contemporary is a crisis in as much as it's, you know, separated from any crisis that's happening in the world. I mean, I think contemporary art is not isolated from the world and artists are very much affected by and like drawing on the social, political and economic and psychological and technological crises that are kind of part of the world today. You know, I think institutionally also, you know, the, the challenges that art institutions are facing are similar to the challenges that other institutions, whether they're academic or political, are facing. So I think, I don't think it's a particular moment of crisis in as much as our entire world is, is in that, in that same situation. I think that's kind of the way that you hope it should be, art should be able to kind of meet these moments and respond to these moments in particularly unique ways. Okay, thank you. I guess contemporary art is not really in crisis. <laughs> <laughs> um, anyway, Richard, your, your take on this. I think I would argue that it is in, in at least one sense, which is that it, the art world has become one of these discourse bubbles that we're so familiar with today, um, which excludes the vast majority of humankind. I just checked the figures this morning. There are 7.9 billion people on Earth today. I don't know the number of people who are interested in contemporary art but I know that it's very small. <laughs> and you and think you it's math, smaller than it once was, or much smaller than it once was? Probably so, because we no longer have a shared framework of beliefs that is shared by the majority of people. And I feel that people within the art world are not at all interested in engaging with people who don't agree with them. Very good at, at reinforcing each other, their own particular set of beliefs, but not in dealing with the larger populace. Okay, I'll leave you there because I think we're gonna pursue that line of thought at a later point, but I think it's a provocative place to stop. So I, I wanna ask you, or at least, I think I wanna start with Richard with this idea that this paradox that great art we've always felt is informed by the past, but that it also breaks with the past. That seems like a contradiction. Do you think that holds for contemporary art? Tell me if so, how, and if not, how then contemporary art differs from contemporary art of the past? It sort of depends where you're looking in part. You know, we have an artist here today, Kelly, who is very much in touch with the Eastern tradition and whose work at the same time is engaged in the contemporary scene. So that's an example of someone who makes it work. My feeling is that she's probably in the minority, however. Oh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> well, she does want to be original, right? <laughs> uh, many artists who are coming on the scene today are surprisingly unaware of the historical past or historical in both senses, not only the artistic past, but any felt or living sense of the past and what it was like to be a human being in a different time and place and have a different implement and sensibility from ours. Okay, well, Kelly, let me follow up with you on this same question. Do you think about history, art history, your own history when creating art do you think about doing something new when creating art, your art? Do you think about both? Do you think about neither? Well, that's a very interesting and relevant question for me because I definitely think about art history a lot. Actually, I studied art history and I have a master's degree with a focus on traditional Chinese paintings. So I wrote about ancient Song Dynasty paintings and my primary interest was studying ancient Chinese art, although I did study modern art and contemporary art and all different kinds of global art disciplines, I actually didn't want to go to visual art school because I don't want to say I don't like other artists because I do. But I do feel like when you go to art school, there's a certain pressure 
to conform to the political ideology or the interest that reigns among the students at the time that you're there. And you're kind of subject to that criticism. And I don't always think that that's a good way to learn how to make art because then you're being too influenced by everything around you instead of your own personal story, the own, your own true, truly the things that you want to engage with. So by studying my own history, I was able to, and my own cultural background through art, I was able to connect more deeply with that part of myself and find the ways that ancient artists internalized these subject matters and techniques to make it their own, to tell a personal story. Gary and Leo, on this same point, or perhaps a slightly different angle on it, the idea of doing something new, which is so much a part of of anything contemporary or avant-garde. I mean, I, I think it's interesting to hear Kelly talk about her link to the past, but I look at her art behind her and it is certainly novel. But I wonder if there is a point in art and from your experience where newness or disruption or whatever becomes almost rote, that there is nothing left to be new about, that being shocked or being surprised becomes harder and harder. And one of you is a curator, one of you is a gallerist and collector. Do you find that you're still surprised by art or do you feel that there is the possibility that we've reached the end of something in the idea of creating newness? I would certainly say there's still a sense of newness. Art history is vital to contemporary art. The big thing that I do at Prince and Worcester, and I'm very lucky to do, is showing the contemporary art in context with art history. The foundation of art history allows us to understand the contemporary art more. Many artists are inspired by art history, even if they aren't directly referencing it in their work. It still is there, and it never is not going to be there. When I work with a new artist, I feel like I see something new all the time. Picasso, which I'm paraphrasing, said, good artists copy, great artists steal. <laughs> uh, market and collectors certainly have a sense of comfort in the known. I think it's important to push that boundary with shows and interesting work and showing how contemporary artists have pushed art history forward. Would you agree with that, Gary? Yes, I definitely agree with that. Um, you know, I think coming from an institution where we do show a lot of new art by, you know, younger generations of artists, newness and like a shock is not necessarily a value in and of itself that what we're looking for. But I think, you know, the world is constantly changing and artists are constantly, you know, reinventing ways of talking about different subjects. I mean, certainly technology and the way that we experience the world has changed drastically in in our lifetimes, and that has certainly affected the art that's been made. So, you know, I don't anticipate the world stop stopping to change. I want to talk about money and the art world, because when we think about contemporary art, we think about the economic side. I mean, I think many people do, especially because we've heard about people investing in art and putting the art in warehouses where they never see it, and it's just an investment, and the big capital side of art, this seems something new and disturbing, actually. And I wonder if you feel it, and I'll ask this of Richard, do you feel that it is an important element of the art world now and is distorting or has an effect on the quality of art being produced? Oh, uh, sure. I think it's a major factor. You know, I often give the example of an art writer who writes a review or an article on one hand and a collector who writes a million dollar check on the other, <laughs> who's going to have the greatest influence. To a certain degree, the art world finds, its, finds itself echoing the taste of a very small elite of super rich individuals. Money, of course, has a significant role in the art world. In terms of the speculators, it's often a shame 
if they resell something very quickly or do so in an inappropriate manner. However, many of those collectors are also buying 100 to 300 works a year, mm. and many smaller galleries would not survive without them buying. So although they could be a frustrating part of the system, they are in many ways an important part of the system. When I'm collecting young works for myself, I'm looking 20 years down the road. I'm looking to contextualize the historical works in my collection and who I believe is doing the most interesting work now. So I look at it financially in the sense of, is it affordable? Does it make sense? But I'm not looking for an instant return. That can be an issue with many speculators. Um, however, the big tastemakers in the market, they're often on museum boards and acquisition committees, and they're the ones who are spending the most at galleries. The galleries need those people to continue going the artists down to the art handlers and every other person in the organization. If you look historically, buying fantastic artists who are part of the art historical canon, whether that be Joe Mitchell, Picasso, Basquiat, Warhol, Calder, Magritte, etc., they've performed historically well. And I would argue someone spending that amount of money deserves to know that their money is going to be relatively safe. Maybe they're not going to make money, but if you're spending six to eight to nine figures, I don't think it's wrong to care about the word investment. I think that's actually pretty fair. Do any of you want to address this idea of the art world being much more constricted and much more dominated by money. I think that's a bit of a fantasy <laughs> that there was a time when the art world was like, you know, gigantic and democratic and that money didn't have an impact on it. You know, I think there's way more artists in New York than there were, you know, 60 years ago. And, you know, I think part of the kind of expansion of the kind of commercial asset of the art world has made that possible. Yeah, I, I can't imagine that the criticism would have been different previously that lay people would have thought that like, you know, that what was happening at MoMA and, you know, you know, at the Cedar Bar was more connected to the experiences of a regular everyday person in, <laughs> you know, the Midwest. If we go back to Richard's point, like there is, you know, the audience for, for what, you know, is happening in the art world at any given moment is always, has always been quite small. You know, I think in its best cases, there are, you know, artworks and, and artists who manage to, you know, break through to a large audience. And, you know, I, you know, we talked about Judy Chicago, but, you know, I think, you know, it, it could go, you know, we also did a show a couple of years ago, Faith Ringgold, who was an artist like who within the African-American community, you know, as like, as a much more expansive artist audience than like the, you know, the traditional art world. But I think, you know, even to the sort of timeless works of art that, you know, I think we were also talking about earlier, you know, those things break free and they, you know, they have an audience that, that can be quite large. I think that's our optimistic thing, but on a day-to-day -day basis, you know, the art world has been small and, you know, I think in cer certain ways insular. I guess I would look at it from the other side as well and say that we have a society in which learning about art or enjoying art is less built into the curriculum than it used to be. And so, well, on, the, on the one hand, you have these very rich people who are investing in art. On the other hand, you have young people who maybe have never gone to a museum or never had an art class where it used to be in grade school that you would have art and it may not be the case anymore. And it's certainly been overshadowed by STEM emphasis. You know, art is the first thing cut when there are cuts to the budget of a school, for example. And that will have an effect, I think, on who becomes an artist, and if they do, what kind of training or background or curiosity they have about art and art history. So much contemporary art is politicized, it's political. 
and I, I wonder, do you feel this is a new trend? I mean, the idea of art being above the fray, outside of the political, of course, now the argument would be everything is political. There's no getting outside the fray. But do you feel an, uh, that there is a kind of established notion of what is politically acceptable and or, you know, radical? I feel as though there's a political doctrine in the present moment that most artists subscribe to voluntarily and some feel themselves compelled to comply with, whether they believe it or not. You know, and you can go right down the list, you know, issue by issue, Palestine, abortion, environment, da, 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 da. and there is a correct art world position. In the past, art was certainly political in another sense, in that it glorified the church, it glorified the aristocracy, or it, you know, held up commonly believed notions of, you know, Greek superiority, or <laughs> whatever you may have. It's much more narrowly political in the ballot box sense today, I think. I try to stay a little bit away from politics in my work because as somebody who has a Chinese background during the period of Mao being in charge in China, there was so much political propaganda art that was kind of like mandatory for artists to make. So whenever art becomes too political, I start to get this like propaganda feeling that I don't really, for me personally, it doesn't, it's not my interest. And I don't feel like it's my position to try and influence how people think about politics. And that's their very personal individual decision. So, but I do see that it's becoming very prominent nowadays. Yeah. Richard, you're more of the naysayer in the context of contemporary art. <laughs> how um, did this happen? <laughs> yeah, no, well, we need to have somebody who will, you know, rub up against the, the general view. I take it you're more skeptical about the issue of quality and how it, what rises to the top and why within the contemporary art world. Could you address this? Well, I think this issue that you've just been talking about, the, the branding and the artist identity is, is part of a much larger historical cultural paradigm shift. You know, if you look back to classical age, to the Gothic age, to the Renaissance. Artists at that time were people who made things and they were pretty low on the, <laughs> on the social uh, ladder. And they were considered essentially artisans. And then in the, art, in the Renaissance, we began to have this shift and then with modernism, it, elevating the notion of the artist into a certain kind of being as well exemplified by Duchamp. So and branding, you feel branding may be just an, an evolution or an extrapolation in, mm -hmm. in a sense of that. That's a fascinating idea where the, the person is a very embodiment in a way of, of the artistic expression. And, and that perhaps ties into what's happening on social media with people, you know, curating their own lives and making themselves stars in this fantasy realm. Yeah, the idea of self-curation. Mm -hmm. We're actually almost out of time, and I thought I'd give the artist the last word. And I wonder, Kelly, if you feel that we're in a climate, a current climate, that is more encouraging or discouraging of art and artists. And I guess as a corollary to that, what drives you, what motivates you to keep on creating art? I feel that we're actually living in a very inspiring climate right now because there's so many new technologies and new outlets that could potentially become modes of artistic expression that have yet to be tapped into. And I feel like there's this new young generation that they're, you know, like they grew up with all this technology that for me, it would be a real struggle to learn how to do certain things. But for them, it's like second nature and they're going to be able to communicate in a whole new way. That's pretty exciting, as long as they see the opportunity is there. 
maybe for artists who work in more traditional mediums, it can feel frustrating because it's like, oh, I want people to like my oil paintings of traditional subject matter and nobody cares. But there's always going to be some people who like those modes of expression. And for me, I'm always inspired to keep creating because I'll have some kind of relationship with an idea. So I'll just like find things in my daily life and my lived experience. And I want to communicate that. And I want to take it to a new dimension and like show all the things that I love about traditional landscape paintings and make it new so that people can maybe enjoy the same kind of experience that I have with these art forms. And this has been a, a wonderful and stimulating discussion. And I want to thank our audience for joining us on the civil discourse. And thanks again for being here. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.